Good evening. I'm Susan Bailey, Executive Director of 108 Contemporary. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in tonight for a virtual artist talk with Anita Fields. I know we're all experiencing a little bit of Zoom fatigue, but this is the safest way to have this event tonight. Um, please keep in mind that we will be um, asking for questions at the end of the presentation. So if you can put those in the, in the chat uh, box along the way, we'd appreciate it. And then Anita will um, answer your questions at the end. Since 2013, 108 Contemporary has provided exhibition space in the Tulsa Arts District for the most innovative contemporary craft from Oklahoma and around the world. We're proud to continue on this path by presenting the space between with work by Anita Fields and Molly Murphy Adams through November 21st. So many organizations and individuals have believed in this project and have patiently waited for it to be realized. We appreciate the Osage Nation Foundation for making a catalog publication possible through their generous financial support. Our sincere gratitude also goes out to the exhibition's presenting sponsor, Mid-America Arts Alliance, with support from the National Endowment for the Arts and the state arts agencies of Arkansas, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Texas. In addition, we appreciate the generosity of the Flint Family Foundation and the Tulsa Artists Fellowship. The 108 Contemporary Board of Directors must also be recognized for their support of Oklahoma artists and contemporary fine craft. And as always, the 108 team has been invaluable in bringing this exhibition to life. It's an honor to work with so many people who have such a passion for the mission of this nonprofit organization. Of course, it's also been an honor to work with Anita and Molly on this exhibition, two artists whose work I have followed for many years. Molly will be speaking about her artistic practice next month on November 11th at 7 p.m. And Anita is joining us tonight from her studio in the Tulsa Arts District. Born in Oklahoma, uh, Anita Fields creates works of clay and textiles that reflect the worldview of her native Osage culture. Her practice explores the complexities of cultural influences and the intersection of balance and chaos found within our lives. A Tulsa Artist Fellow since 2017, Anita recently received a prestigious 2021 Idle Jorg Contemporary Art Fellowship. Last year, her work was part of the landmark traveling exhibition, Hearts of Our People, Native Women Artists, which many of you probably saw when it was on display at Philbrook. And so now I would like to turn the screen over to Anita Fields. Thank you, Susan. I really appreciate that introduction. And I want to uh, give a sincere thank you to 108 Contemporary to the institutions, the Osage Nation, the Flint Foundation, uh, everyone who, su who supports this exhibition. Um, you know, and being, being here in Tulsa for the past five years as a Tulsa Artist Fellowship, uh, every, every year, every exploration, every project gives me a deeper appreciation for the connections that we make, the relationship building, because it's so important for uh, our work to continue in this way whether you, know, you are the, the space or as an artist, um, these relationships and partnerships are extremely important for our missions and our work to continue in this way. Um, I also want to say that uh, I'm really grateful to Molly Murphy Adams um, to be able to exhibit with her. And this exhibit was actually supposed to happen last year and it was postponed due to, due to the pandemic. And so m m many of the works that I'm going to speak about tonight also you know, were made during these times in isolation. And, and I'm gonna talk about some of those uh, kinds of issues you know, that, that came up during this time period while I was working. So you know, I'm gonna kind of just start with an overview of my artist statement so that you'll get a, an idea and a feeling for um, the work that I do and why I do it. Um, can we pull up that first image, belonging to the earth and sky? So my practice is multidisciplinary 
and I engage with several mediums and techniques, but my primary focus is always clay and textiles and the combination of the two. And sometimes, uh, you know, the combination of the two is the primary focus might be the textiles or the primary focus uh, might be the clay, but uh, also there is this intersection of where those two things meet and a, a combination of those things when I feel, you know, that is necessary to tell the story I'm trying to tell. Initially, I was captivated with clay at a very young age because of its immediacy, its transformative qualities, and the endless possibilities that it affords. And I know that my affinity for textiles and creating by way of a needle and thread are directly related to being taught to sew by my grandmother when I was really young. Um, I started doing that when I was actually about six years old. In my work, uh, you'll find heavily textured layers, spontaneous mark making, and exaggerated writing. And these create surfaces, uh, the qualities on earthen forms and fabrics, the marks and impressions are the language of survival used to deconstruct the complex layers and distortion of truths found in the colonizers written history of the indigenous cultures. I explore the human form, variations of the body, and concepts related to the Osage worldview of order and balance. Landscapes, the environment, and the powerful influences of nature are recurring themes that you will see in my work. They reflect time, place, and how the earth holds the memory of cultures who once called a specific place home. By articulating the concepts of balance and the symbiotic relationships found throughout uh, life and nature, I hope to, under, uh, to deepen the understanding of the intersection of all living things. Influenced by the nuances of memory, experiences, dreams, social issues, and everyday encounters, I'm simply making expressions about what it means to be alive and that, you know, relatable moments that we can all uh, understand. My work signifies a continuum of thought, knowledge, and the essence of who we are as indigenous people living in a modern, chaotic, and challenging world. I want to convey the beauty and the importance of other cultures and the thought that there are many ways of looking at the world. So I create narratives that ask the viewers to consider other ways of seeing and being and in a way to understand our shared experience. Uh, I'm, I'm really you know, hoping to dispel the many myths that surround um, indigenous cultures and native people. Um, you know, I want them to know what, what a beautiful culture that we come from and uh, the many contributions that we have made. And because there's just a lot of misinformation out there about indigenous people in the 39 tribes who reside here in Oklahoma. This first piece um, is made out of silk. It's photo transfer on silk and it has metallic fringe and uh, satin um, at the top satin holders for the dowel rods that, that it hangs from. This is um, actually, th this came from um, the inside of an Osage wedding coat was the first place that I utilized this imagery. And, uh, you know, I, I want to continue using that imagery to, to say certain things. So when I was talking earlier about the kinds of things, um, you know, Osage worldview, and that is recognition of the earth and the sky, on the panel that you see on the left um, um, is the Osage syllabary, the Osage uh, orthography, uh, it says earth, and on the left, um, excuse me, I've got that, on the right is the one for earth, and on the one on the left is, on the, is, is the sky. So this talks about uh, Osage worldview, history, and the consequences of treaties. Up there on the top, uh, in the center, is an image of my great grandfather, and there are curlew uh, birds flanked on either side of him. At the bottom are oil wells and cone flowers, and there is the treaty. Um, uh, one of the there was three major treaties that kept moving us moving us from our original homelands west and then finally down into you know, Indian territory, what we know now as, as Oklahoma. Um, so this is the Treaty of 1808 and it describes, so what I'm talking about here is this massive loss of land for us. And the cone flowers are associated with cultural information. The oil wells represent the effects of oil production on Osage land. 
uh, and they form the bottom border. The two side panels reflect the cosmo cosmological knowledge and our relationship to the earth and sky. Um, and I thought like this was a good place to kind of begin this conversation that we're gonna to have tonight because so much of my work embodies this thought. Okay, next. This is made out of porcelain. So I'm gonna also kind of talk about process, you know, as we move along here. This is made out of porcelain, it's slab built. Um, it's collaged with handmade paper and also with, with gold metallic inks. And it's, it's called Wrap With Thought. As an Osage woman, you know, I was taught by my grandmother that when we go to our social dances, when we go to our ceremonial uh, dances, when we, go, when we attend things as an, as an Osage lady, to wrap your things up into this cloth bundle and uh, arrive there. And this is really a universal, you know, this is really quite universal for, for uh, females. Uh, lots of cultures, you know, carry things like this. But also with the thought of this, you know, when I'm creating something like this, I'm thinking about um, what does that hold? You know, what does that actually hold? Uh, yes, that's the way that we attend um, our dances and our functions, you know, wrapping our things up in this bundle. But to me, I'm kind of always also looking for that thought of uh, what is the action that we are actually doing? You know, what are we gonna learn from this experience? Uh, why are we taking these things wrapped up? A lot of times when we have a giveaway, you know, within our community, uh, the items will be wrapped up in, in, in a scarf, a piece of material. Um, you know, if it's really big, so that somebody might take a sheet and wrap their things up there. So, you know, but all along with, with all of those activities, you know, we are doing something that is important to our culture in terms of exchange and thankfulness and sharing. Next. Purse with the sun. I started, I, I have made uh, throughout my career a series of purses. And the first ones that I started making were actually kind of done with pointillism so that they emulated a beaded bag. And that thought came from um, a memory that I had when I was very young, when I would go visit a relative with my grandmother. And she had a beaded purse that was given to her by her husband's family who were uh, the Omaha people. And my memory of that was that it resided in the same place for as long as I remember going to their home. And so, you know, not only am I talking about a purse and its contents and the kinds of things that we carry, um, you know, I'm also thinking about uh, memories, you know, in terms of, of uh, that kind of thinking. Um, as women, we keep all kinds of things in our purses during different times in our lives. You know, when my kids were really young, oh my gosh, I had bottles in there, I had, uh, toys, I had, you know, snacks, I had, I mean, I had a really heavy purse. <laughs> so, um, you know, at different times in our lives, we, we carry different things uh, that are meaningful to us and that are necessary, actually, you know, in terms of, of, of what we, uh, where we are at at that time period in our lives. Process, this is slab built. Uh, it uses uh, gold glaze, um, under glazes, and there's actually a fabric little pillow in there holding up the cloud. So the imagery also is, you know, referencing what I was talking about earlier, this knowledge of, uh, of, um, of, of, the, of the cosmos, you know, and, and how that plays into our worldview as Osage people. Next. Earthen shoes. Uh, these are patterned after actual Osage women's moccasins. This, so, you know, I, I want to clarify here that these are not the kind of designs that we use on our moccasins, but these, this is the style. And these are actually, when I started making these, I actually used the pattern that I have to make Osage moccasins and thought about, you know, how I can um, emulate those in terms of, you know, not sewing them, uh, it's not fabric, but I felt like I could start hand building them in the same way that I, I sew them. Um, these, you know, were actually in the beginning, I was, I was with a, a group of Osage people in a book club and, um, 
we were re we were reading information uh, ethnography ethnography reports, and it was talking about um, the Earth and Sky clans, and it was talking about the movement of when they would begin, you know, um, a ceremonial dance, depending on if you belong to the Earth clans or you belong to the Sky clan, determined which foot that you would begin um, dancing with. And we all kind of in that group, you know, looked at each other and it was kind of like the light bulb went on, you know, because I know when I was a really young person, you know, my grandmother and my aunties, they would say, now, when you go out there and you start dancing, you know, start with your right foot. So they would tell you these instructions, but sometimes they wouldn't give you the rest of the information. And so um, we were all really, you know, delightfully surprised, you know, to hear, to hear that story. And so this is kind of always the basis of what I'm thinking about when I create these. And they're made out of uh, just clay with underglazes. I also use an applicator um, uh, with these little metal tips, you know, to uh, apply uh, designs. I also use, you know, things like scraffito techniques, uh, the scraping of clay, you know, to reveal a color underneath it are some of the techniques that I use in my work. Next. So this is called disruption, and this is wood, fabric, ink, and thread. Um, you can kind of get a sense of, of, of how big it is here in, in the uh, photograph, 50, 56 and a half inches by 48 by 40. Um, so this represents, uh, it represents what is known as the Osage Reign of Terror. So, Everybody's probably familiar by now that Martin Scorsese was in Osage County filming uh, a film having to um, relating to the Reign of Terror, and this was uh, this little house was made in 2017, and with the discovery of oil on the Osage Reservation in the 1920s, this brought unimaginable wealth to tribal members, but in attempts to um, take over Osage fortunes, there became an era of murder deceit and avarice descended among us and, and our communities. Local whites seeking to, to inherit the newfound holdings began befriending tribal members and infiltrating into families by marrying Osage women. Rarely investigated, the unofficial number of murders is a horrifying 27. Osages were shot, poisoned, and three people, were, people perished when a bombed Osage home exploded in the darkness of the night. So in this, you know, I'm, I've got some fabric here. I've got um, a, a, a velvet that has impressed designs in it. And I, I, you know, and because the other side is this material that has metallic threads in it, but also it has this distorted writing that I think I was referring to when I was talking in my artist statement, talking about these very kind of facts that I just read uh, with this distorted writing. And, you know, again, what I said earlier, referencing uh, this distortion of um, our history many times, you know, it's just, it's, it's one-sided. It comes from one viewpoint. You know, what I wanna say about this is that, you know, as horrifying as this story is, and, and that is kind of right now, you know, being told, these are stories that, that as Osage people, we grew up, you know, we knew about these, we grew up hearing them. Uh, you know, because these kinds of things, you know, like I said, it, it, it placed a lot of fear uh, in our homes and our hearts. Next. Curved shapes of the earth are uh, recent, real recent works. Um, and I'm gonna talk about process a little bit. So these are uh, hand-built, coil-built, each one of them. And they are made out of porcelain clay with the, the tops of them. The stems are, are created with uh, the gold as a gold luster glaze. Uh, and then those are actual uh, clay seeds, you know, that come in, that are placed, you know, scattered about in this installation. The textures are made with uh, handmade stamps that I, that I make, um, began making these years ago when, uh, Throughout my travels, you know, I would find something very small and put it in my pocket and bring it back to the studio. 
and uh, make these impressions into soft clay with it so that it became uh, a recording of um, my journey, my travels, but also it started, you know, kind of turning into a language um, that I thought of, 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 that I was building for myself because this was reflective of where I've been and what I've seen and what I've heard. And um, I grew up as, as a young person um, listening to, my grandmother was a full blood Osage lady and all of her peers and relatives, that is what they spoke to one another. So I, I, I'm very interested in my work and the idea of language and um, the, the translations of language and uh, you know the differences in language. So the Osage language is a very beautiful language. It's, it, it, uh, it's been described as painting a picture many times. So I think of this language that I know within you know my artwork and the clay work and uh, the fabric work that that this is the language that 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 I understand as an artist. Next. This is called Threads of Continuum and it's made with satin ribbons. There's, uh, you can kind of see it on the bottom. The floor is actually Osage ribbon work. And so hanging from the top are needles and thread and metal sequins. Uh, metal sequins you'll find oftentimes in uh, Osage uh, work on our clothing, creating patterns and designs. Um, this house has these needles hanging from the roof with threads. It, and you know, in, in my work, I often think of um, the kind of activities that take place in, in uh, indigenous communities and particularly in Osage community. I'm thinking about um, the continuum of people making ribbon work creating clothing so that their children can participate in our dance, our dances. Uh, young men are, in, are initiated into our, our ceremonial dance, the Ingolnska. And, you know, it's a very costly and uh, time consuming process for people to make these items. And so they are made with great love and prayer and families, all families pitch in and help one another, support one another. And so these are the ideas that I'm thinking of, you know, when, I, when I'm uh, creating this, I'm, think, I'm thinking of people who are lovingly creating something and supporting one another all throughout the year, you know, to make this very important experience happen for their young people. Not all is for sale is, um, you know, two feet high dress. I make a lot of dresses. I make a lot of clothing, you know, because I feel like it reflects uh, this idea of transformation, transformation, not only of the, uh, of, of uh, a physical transformation, but a, a transformation, you know, that takes place within us uh, uh, inwardly and a transform, you know, a transformation of the way we think and see things. And a lot of times these are indicative of Native American clothing, but also they can just be as simple as, as, as something here like this dress. Um, and this is called Not All is for Sale. And you see this writing, you know, that I was kind of referring to earlier, this distorted writing. Um, and so, you know, it's called Not All is for Sale because I was really thinking when I was creating this of, uh, of uh, lands, particularly, you know, indigenous lands that remain on private, privately owned, uh, I'm trying to think how I want to word this. Uh, they are actually indigenous lands and sacred sites with sacred uh, meanings and, and uh, events that happened on these on these sites, but they are in, in uh, they belong on land that belongs to non-Indian people. And there is sometimes very little, there's very little to, to protect them. And this is something that happened within um, uh, our nation, you know, a few weeks ago, where there's a very, uh, a site that is extremely sacred and um, important. And um, it, it, it's, it's on private property. And so uh, there was an auction and this, and this land was auctioned off. And, you know, so my thought is that that not all things are for sale. All things are not, mon you know, meant to be translated into uh, into a monetary. Um, they don't all have a price, you know. And who does that actually belong to anyway? So, you know, 
uh, there are laws protecting all kinds of issues dealing with land, uh, you know, with the NAGPRA laws, but a lot of times they fall short in terms of protecting land that is on private property. Next. To be heard. So here again, you see this impressed, uh, this is porcelain with gold leaf and gold luster glaze, a megaphone, um, and it's, you know, it's called, it's titled To Be Heard. Um, I think it's, you know, it's just really important to acknowledge uh, the voice of the many voices that we are hearing, you know, come, uh, standing up, st standing out front, talking about, you know, the rights, talking about, you know, um, all kinds of issues, you know, and, and, and primarily this began, you know, I mean, this has always been there, but, but you know, it, 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 the, it was amplified during the pandemic, um, you know, of, of people standing up for, you know, these different rights. And, you know, I think it's just really important that we acknowledge that, uh, you know, people need to be heard. And this is what I was kind of talking about earlier in my statement, you know, when I was talking about there are all kinds of ways of looking at things, you know, issues that surround us. Uh, this is a series called Move Forward, and there are six of these. They are mixed media collages. They are made with thread, paper, cloth, inks, paints, metal sequins. They, each one of them has um, archival uh, facsimiles of archival documents. And those documents actually come out of research that I did at, at the Gilcrease Museum. And these are uh, documents that are, um, I'm trying to find my thing here. Uh, documents that are, were written primarily by Indian agents, uh, you know, in the early, in the 1800s, they were written by journalists of that time period. They were written by shopkeepers. Uh, and, you know, I, 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 I found it interesting that again, you know, when I'm talking about um, this, this, these misconceptions and this, this one way of looking at things. And, um, you know, one of my goals when I'm working on a series like this is, is, is to address those kinds of things because those words, that language that were used in them is a one-way street of defining how, how they saw Osage people. And, um, you know, when I'm, when I'm making these, I'm thinking about, um, and this kind of goes back to the banners, you know, that I was showing earlier in the beginning, is that as, as, as Osage people, our language, our art, our culture has always defined who we are. And, you know, we, we have a very strong sense of our identity and we know who we are. We are not defined by these kinds of words that are derogatory about us and that are, are you know, formed with misinformation. So I think we're going to go through these, you know, kind of one by one. I believe that's how we had it. Okay, so this is the first one that I made. Um, and it has this upside down figure. Uh, the figure, you know, like I was talking about earlier is prominent in, in much of my work. And so this figure is upside down because, um, you know, this information that, is, that was being put out, you know, according to this document, you know, is, is it, it's, it's upside down, it's, it's not correct. Um, so, you know, when I was making this series, I, these are all based, uh, the um, substrate is, is, a, is a handkerchief. And this is the foundation for these mixed media collages. So, I, you know, I was thinking that the um, handkerchief, it's something that holds our tears. It, it, it holds our sorrows and our griefs. And, you know, here in Oklahoma in these blistering hot summer days, um, you know, we dab our brows and our face with a, with a, with a handkerchief. And I remember my eco, and eco is the word for grandmother in Osage. And she would uh, tie her jewelry up into them, her rings. Uh, it was not uncommon, you know, I use the word other goodies here, but I actually saw her, you know, like put a chicken leg in there and then she would throw that in her purse. Um, you know, she would just casually toss that into her purse. So this cloth seemed like it is fitting and suitable for a humble base to hold my thoughts about a world turned upside down. And so, I started this, this actually is the very first one. And, and this was when we were in total isolation. This is when everything was shut down. 
And so in isolation, I think of what it means to withstand a pandemic and hardships. I use ink on transparent paper to record my thoughts. I tear facsimiles of historical documents found in museum archives to drive points further. Unimaginable references about an agent forcing an educated Osage into irons until he agrees to wear store-bought clothing. I embroider a human form with gold metallic threads to remind myself how important it is to keep making, to keep creating. I think of the tribulations of our ancestors, their ability to move forward like the path of the sun. And we are familiar with what it means to, um, to survive and to, to keep moving forward. So in this one, there is another document um, that on the, on the left with red and uh, on the other side of that, it's made out of sandpaper. Um, our Osage is an, you know, a pattern that we use in our clothing uh, known as Osage ribbon work. We use, you know, we use satin ribbons. And I remember when I was creating this one that one of the, um, since we were in the middle of the, you know, the pandemic and this isolation, um, I felt it was really important to, to just use the materials that I had at hand to not be trying to, you know, send for supplies and, and you know, to have Amazon uh, deliver, you know, these, these supplies to me. Um, actually, when I buy our supplies, you know, I, I, I really need to see them. So um, I just felt like it was really important to, you know, to, to kind of uh, rifle through the, what I had here at my studio in terms of, and I'm, I'm a great scrap keeper, you know, <laughs> so um, to just kind of utilize what I had. And so you see this, you know, this distorted writing in ink, you see it in graphite. Um, there's some embroidery thread on there. And I like the idea of using that sandpaper, you know, to incorporate that into this pattern because, uh, you know, I was just thinking, you know, things can get rough at, at certain times in our lives. Next. This is the third one, and this is with uh, handmade paper, metal sequins, archival document, the facsimile, but also this, this um, metallic thread that I sewed, I sewed with my machine and you know, arranged it into this, to this place and used, a, used a, an agent that, that would you know, kind of make it stiff. And so that way I was able to transfer that you know, in, in uh, um, as one unit into the work. This uh, has the um, facsimile, metallic paint, the inks on paper, handmade paper, the metal sequins, and uh, the metallic embroidery. And this is an image of my dad in his Osage clothing when he was a young man. Next. So the paper at the bottom of this with the red ink, uh, this is some paper that was given to me. And I, I think that it's real transparent. I, I, I um, really like using papers that are transparent. Uh, and I like the idea of layering them so that you can see you know, what is revealed underneath that. Um, there's a drawing of corn in, in the center, you know, thinking about um, the foods that have sustained us as indigenous people and the importance of them and the importance of, uh, there's a real revival right now of indigenous foods uh, because they actually, you know, are connected to our survival. And this last one uh, has the kusha. This was at the same time that I was hand building the uh, porcelain uh, kusha squashes. And so this is just an extension of that kind of thought. And again, you know, that importance of this kind of food that has sustained us as, as native people. And um, how, you know, that we still, this, this, we still continue that use of these foods. Okay, so this is called, this is a series of four um, clay figures that hang on the wall. And they're about 15 inches um, high, you know, each one of them. They have uh, gold glaze 
They have collages with handmade paper, paper um, cutouts. I often use, uh, you know, like I said, I'm a great scrap keeper and I have boxes and boxes of just these little tidbits of things that I, you know, that I utilize in, my, in other works. And, uh, you know, I find them just as, as tiny as they are, that they're just really beautiful and exquisite. And so I know that somewhere down the line, I'm going to be able to use those. And so um, we have a figure on the left with, um, you know, holding her fist into the air. We have a figure next to that, you know, as we move along to the right with a, um, a bandana on her face. Uh, and also she has, a, and the collage around her waist is um, a snake making a reference to Standing Rock, to the movement up there to, to stop uh, the, the flow of oil. Um, we have a figure next to that. And then we also on the end, we have another figure that is, uh, has a bandana around their face. And so, you know, process wise, I hand build these and with three or four different methods. I coil build, I, I, I just, you know, kind of form and shape them uh, with, with the, I make their legs separately and their arms separately. I make the body, uh, you know, I pinch it out until, you know, it's something that I'm satisfied with. And then letting those, you know, the stages of clay, you know, to, to come to a place where I can start assembling them together. You know, one of the things that I was thinking about when I was creating these is, um, you know, these movements that I was talking about earlier in terms of uh, people speaking out and, you know, the issues that are really important to them. They're not just important to that one group, you know, specifically, they're important to, they are important to all of us, you know, in terms of something like uh, what was happening at Standing Rock. Um, you know, when you think of future generations and you think of, you um, how important it is for us to have a clean environment because down the road that is going to affect every single one of us uh, you know the importance of having clean and healthy drinking water for our future generations uh, these are the kinds of things you know that you know these ideas that i think that we need to you know need to contemplate you know when we look at some of these issues that are going on in terms of uh, of people standing up for certain rights I think we're probably just about where we wanted to be in terms of questions and um, Yes, thank you so much, Anita. Um, we do have some questions from the audience. So I'll go ahead and, and start asking you those. Um, the first one is, could you talk a little more about the patterns and repetition used similar to how you use text, do these patterns and designs have a language of their own? I, for my, you know, for my thinking, I believe that they have started, that's what they have started developing into. Um, because when I was kind of describing to you the different uh, tools that I use to make, um, you know, the, those lines and uh, different patterning, you know, that they are, you know, they're, oftentimes they are just little bitty applicators that have these uh, metal tips. And depending on how large that metal tip is that I put on it, you know, that kind of controls the flow of the underglaze or the glaze that I'm using. It, it, uh, it controls, you know, the size of uh, the width, for instance, you know, of the line. And so, you know, just on, before I apply that to my, to my clay pieces, I'll just do, you know, on a, on a, on paper, you know, I'll kind of, I'll kind of play with those, you know, to see what kind of line, you know, that I can start applicate, you know, this, this application that I can put onto the uh, figures or, or, or any surfaces, you know, that have the underglaze on them to begin with. But um, I like that idea of design and pattern in terms of, um, you know, loosely, you know, referencing um, a, a, a language and uh, kind of an unknown, an, an unknown language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I could apply it with paintbrushes, you know, too, but it's gonna have a very different feel about it, you know, when I do that. 
Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, the lack of arms on the figure seems to be intentional. Is that true? Yes. So it wasn't that long ago that I actually started adding arms. Um, for a very long time, almost all of those kinds of figures you know, did not have arms. And, and I was often asked that question and I didn't really think of it as, as a lack of something, but I thought of it more of um, just, you know, representation of the human. Yes, it's a physical representation of the human body, but also, you know, in my mind, I, I saw it more as a representation of the human spirit. And so, you know, when I was creating them without arms, I didn't really think of it that it was, it was lacking something, you know, I saw it more as kind of this uh, uh, universal figure. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question um, is about your choices of color. Could you speak a little bit more about um, the, the importance of color in your work? Mm -hmm. I, as you, probably have noticed I don't use a whole lot of color. I stick to a palette that is black, white, gold. Uh, and, you know, and I would say in my textiles that that is more where I move out of that kind of uh, thought and move into more of a, a, a color palette. And I was actually trained as a painter in the beginning when I went to school at the Institute of American Indian Arts in the very early 70s. I went there to be a painter and this was my first experience there you know, of working with clay and, um, you know, I found it to be uh, that my work, I felt like it was so much stronger, you know, that I, I was able to make a stronger expression of what I was, uh, you know, trying to put forth, you know, when I, when I was be able to work with this clay. So um, again, kind of going back to what I was talking about, that duality and that thought of duality, that thought of, and, you know, and that encompasses so much. I mean, that encompasses all kinds of things. It encompasses not only the earth and sky, but you know the night and day, and um, good, evil. You know, um, man, woman. You know, there's there's many ways we can look at it. And so that black and white, I also feel like that is indicative of um, you know zeroing in on that kind of um, that duality. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's kind of a, a segue into a, a question um, um, about. Um, sort of the, the, your use of, of different materials. I mean, this exhibition is a great example of how you work in clay and textiles and collage. Um, could you please talk about how you decide which material um, is the right one for the content of the individual work? Sure. Along with that, you know, I want to add that um, you know, working with with something, uh, you know, that I'm going to create, for instance, you know, the banners, uh, silk. That you know, you know, when we're talking about uh, touch and and tact, you know, tactile, you know, the 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 sensories, you know, that I use as an artist, um, very different, you know, from the medium of clay. You know, clay is. Uh, well, my ideas about clay are that, you know, it's, 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 it's very human, it's very basic. I mean, you know, after almost 50 years of working with clay, I know that clay is very, has very human-like qualities, um, you know, and you will often, often see, you know, in the same, very basic shapes of vessels and, uh, you know, things that we relate to, you know, that we think of when we think of clay, you know, that, that these are rem reminiscent of, of the human form, of human shape. And so that, you know, idea of a material coming out of the earth, and that is one of the first materials that man ever created to make expressions in terms of art, um, I find that really fascinating. And that, you know, it still is, that, that still resonates, you know, with me as an artist today, you know, extremely, it's very strong, you know, within me. Mm -hmm. But then the ability to be able to go to a material that has a, a, a very different feel to it, 
uh, you know, that it, it's soft and it's, you know, but again, it comes from the earth, you know, the material, you know, if it's, if it's cotton, if it's silk, if it's, I love working with silk. I mean, just the touch, you know, the feel of it is, is so smooth. And so, uh, you know, it really touches a place um, with the senses of um, you, you understand that it's a natural material that it, that it's, that it's, um, you know, created, um, you know, that it is created in a very special way, just because of the way that it feels. Well, this goes back to also what I'm talking about in terms of this, this duality, you know, I'm talking about two uh, different uh, ends of the spectrum in terms of materials and how they feel for me as an artist. So, when I'm thinking of an idea or I'm thinking of work that I want to start putting out there, I actually just kind of imagine it, you know, to be uh, with a certain material and I will begin that way. You know, if I feel like this is, you know, this needs to be rendered in clay, then that's how I will begin with that. If I, if I you know, kind of start picturing it and imagining it in uh, fiber or textile, you know, that is, that is how I think of it too. Um, but also, you know, in terms of, you know, using uh, embroidery thread, in terms of using threads and, um, you know, these very long held traditions of uh, work, you know, that, that, uh, that have held up, you know, over time in memorial, you know, to be able to make expressions. Um, I'm totally comfortable, you know, kind of moving about all of those materials. Um, thank you. Um, and I think finally, um, you've talked a little bit about this already tonight, um, especially with um, talking about the, the collage work, but could you speak a little bit about um, how COVID has impacted your perspective on, on art and life and um, you know, what that's been like for the last year and a half? Mm -hmm. And I've had plenty of time to think about all that. <laughs> so I want to say that in the beginning, it was really difficult um, where I thought that these materials that I'm so familiar with, um, because my work is always, you know, has always been uh, my refuge. Um, I thought I could just go to that place immediately and, you know, and it, it would make me feel better. And, and that wasn't quite true in the beginning. In fact, it really surprised me. I was having difficulty. Uh, um, things weren't, you know, things weren't working. It's, it's almost like my hands didn't remember. Um, when I started a couple of pieces, I remember that, you know, that they, they, they just didn't work. You know, I actually had a clay piece that just kind of fell apart in my hands. I had a fiber piece that um, felt like I didn't know how to sew anymore, that I didn't know how to, you know, manipulate my, my hands and my fingers with, with the needle. Um, and so, you know, I had to stop and kind of think about what was happening there. And I know that it was related to, uh, I felt like it was related to this, this, you know, this uncertainty and these moments of, um, you know, there's a lot of fear in the beginning, you know, we didn't know, uh, we, we weren't, we were informed, but we, you know, there was just so much uncertainty about how this was all working. And so as time went along, you know, I was, I was more able to, to get back to that place where uh, I felt really comfortable, you know, with the materials that I was using. It was in the beginning kind of difficult to work in isolation. Um, and actually, you know, I didn't have access to my studio for a very long time. And so I think that had something to do with it too. I was trying to work in an environment, you know, for instance, in the beginning, what, at one point I was working, trying to just work on the side of my living room. And another instance I tried to, you know, my husband and I tried to set up with this little, it was almost like a tent situation out in the yard, but it was still pretty cold outside. And so, and then of course that affects, you know, clay, um, you know, what the atmosphere is around you. So I actually found it, you know, pretty difficult to kind of work because I'm, I'm actually very used to working in, you know, in the, an environment that is, that is, you know, it's, it, it works for what I'm, it's suitable, you know, to what I'm doing and have all my supplies there and have, uh, 
um, a place, you know, to, you know, I'm, re I'm really grateful for the studio that I have with the Tulsa Artist Fellowship. Um, so I didn't have access, you know, to those things for a while. And so that made it um, also very difficult to work, you know, just in, in my living room or, um, a, you know, a very limited space. Um, but, but I have done that, you know, in my earlier years, I have, I have made many, many things on my kitchen table. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it, it was, it took a while to have that feeling of, um, you know, my, my, my work is, is, is actually part of this process to help me start processing through, you know, what is happening here. Because, I mean, there are moments, you know, at this time period, as we go in and out of this pandemic, uh, where, you know, things feel very surreal, they feel, you know, there's still uncertainty, uncertainty you know, that we are facing, uh, there's been great loss, there's been grief, you know, there's been, uh, we all know people, you know, who, who have been, who had this, we know people who, but there's been great loss, and it's, 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 you know, it's very sad, and it's, it's hard to kind of process that, because that is not the normal, you know, that we are used to, and so uh, there's still a great deal of processing going along with that. But um, I know, you know, really actually, you know, much of the work that is in the exhibition right now was, you know, was made in the, uh, in the last year, you know, during some of these times. And there were often times in, you know, my mind that I thought if, you know, I, I, I'll be okay, but, you know, once I get to the studio and I can just start, you know, hand building with that clay and I can roll out a coil and I can add it. And, and I know once my, my hands touch that earth, you know, and then I'm able to construct and build with it, that, that it's going to make me feel better. And I know, you know, one of my, you know, because one of the things, you know, when I, as an artist that I'm always thinking about is that, um, you know, I, I mean, again, move forward, you know, the whole series, you know, that thought of, you know, it, how important it is to move forward, to keep moving, to create it, you know, to keep creating. And, um, you know, it's, it's so extremely important to, to have hope, to not, to not give up and, and to, um, to have hope, you know, for the future. Well, thank you. Um, we have so much gratitude uh, to you, Anita, for sharing your work in this exhibition and your um, thoughts tonight uh, during this presentation. Um, I, I don't see any further questions. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone to please come see the work in person. And um, the gallery is open Wednesday through Sunday from 12 to 5 p.m. And admission is always free. So I hope people will will come and see the work uh, more than once. And um, I think every time you see it, you'll see something new. So um, thank you so much, Anita. This has been a, a pleasure to work with you um, this, this past two years on this um, project. And so thankful that it's finally here around us and um, we're very grateful, so. Yes, thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Um, Thank you. And thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, we will be posting a link um, at some point uh, with a recording of an, an edited recording uh, of tonight's uh, presentation. So uh, if you missed any of it, um, please look for that on Facebook. So thank you very much, Anita. And thank you to everyone for being here virtually. Good night. Good night. <laughs>